Tonight, the UK calls out China for trying to hack Westminster, but Conservative MPs complain the response is feeble. Deputy Prime Minister Oliver Dowden tells Parliament Chinese state-affiliated actors were responsible for two cyber attacks against the Electoral Commission and MPs. Well, in a moment, I'll speak to one live, one of the MPs targeted by hackers, who's accusing government officials of being afraid to rock the boat. Also tonight, a by-election's been triggered in Blackpool South as Scott Benton announces he's quitting Parliament. He had been facing a vote on whether to oust him after getting caught up in a lobbying sting. A noisy convoy of tractors has descended on Parliament tonight to protest over a lack of support for British food. We'll be with them live. And if you haven't got enough things to worry about, with foreign adversaries, the economy and the environment to name but a few, officials in Whitehall are apparently obsessing over a mysterious novel about how the UK government would deal with a solar flare strike. We'll explain all. And bringing just about the right amount of heat and light to tonight's proceedings will be John McDonnell and Caroline Noakes, who will be with us for the next hour. It's Monday, I'm Sophie Ridge, live from Westminster, and this is The Politics Hub. Hello, good evening. China, after America, the most powerful country in the world. Its GDP is $17 trillion. Its population, 1.4 billion people. Now, there's a reason that when the US is looking at global threats, it's China they're most concerned about, because China has power. In comparison, the UK is a mere minnow. Our GDP, three trillion. China's economy is more than five times the size of ours. So I guess my first question is, why is China bothering to hack the phones of Conservative backbenchers Ian Duncan Smith, Tim Lawton, and the SNP backbencher Stuart MacDonald? What is going on there? Insecurity or bravado? Hacking foreign politicians' phones just to show they can get away with it. And I guess that leads me to my second question. What is the UK going to do about it? Because last year, our trade with China was worth, get this, £107 billion. Pounds. Cars, clothes, computers. And don't forget, inflation coming down is just about the only good news story that Rishi Sunak has right now in a year when the economy could help decide the next election. So expect strong words, yes, and sanctions targeting some individuals. But don't expect the UK relationship with China to be redrawn. Sometimes when you're facing Goliath, a sling and a stone just isn't going to cut it. Well, we can talk now to Sky's political editor, uh, Beth Rigby, uh, who's here uh, with us. And Beth, you've been looking at this today. Mm. Yeah, it's been quite a curious day because it seemed to come rather left field as to why, just as Parliament was breaking up for Easter, uh, the government was making this announcement about China and calling out China for these two sets of cyber attacks, one on the election watchdog, the electoral uh, commission and the second one on a group of parliamentarians. But what's been clearer over the course of the day is that the reason this is happening now is this is part of a coordinated effort by some allies who are getting more muscular in, in calling out China. And the US have also uh, issued a statement calling out some state-backed uh, uh, Chinese operators in terms of sanctions today. So there's a kind of policy issue here, which is Rishi Sunak on a global stage trying to coordinate with allies. But there's also a domestic policy and politics issue around what he's actually doing about it. So in terms of what the government actually announced, yes, they said that these cyber attacks were linked to China. But what are they doing about it? Uh, two individuals sanctioned, one company sanctioned. Uh, text on my phone from a former cabinet minister said, in a country of over one billion people, two people sanctioned, i.e. a sense that a sense that in terms of uh, what the government is doing, is it robust enough? Uh, and many politicians feel that for all the rhetoric, now the government actually have to change policy and approach in how they assess China as a risk uh, to the country. And they were talking about that in Parliament today, and I think we've got that report. A government plagued by domestic problems forced to pivot to international ones on the last day of business before the Easter break. I now call the Deputy Prime Minister, Right Honourable Oliver Downing. 
the Deputy Prime Minister confirming China's trying to undermine our democracy and sanctions will be enforced. The United Kingdom judges that these actions demonstrate a clear and persistent pattern of behaviour that signal, signals hostile intent from China. That is why the United Kingdom has today sanctioned two individuals and one entity associated with the Chinese state-affiliated APT31 group for involvement in malicious cyber activity targeting officials, government entities and parliamentarians around the world. New sanctions, but the cyber attacks on Britain's election watchdog and a group of parliamentarians long known. And for those MPs targeted, the response simply not enough. America has sanctioned over 40 people in Hong Kong. We have sanctioned none and three lowly officials only in Xinjiang. Surely this means that the integrated review should now be changed. They are not an epoch-defining challenge, strange as that may be, but they are surely a threat. And can they now correct that so that we all know where we are with China? Where the UK wants to be is aligned with allies. The announcement today coordinated with Washington. The US also accusing Chinese state-linked hackers of being behind cyber attacks targeting US businesses, government and politicians. The golden era of Chinese relations under David Cameron in 2015 now seems an age away. We've been very clear that the situation now is that China is behaving in an increasingly uh, assertive way abroad, authoritarian at home, and it represents an epoch-defining challenge uh, and also the greatest state-based threat to our economic security. So it's right that we take measures to protect ourselves, which is what we are doing. United with allies over the threat, but divisions still between government and MPs about how to respond. What well, You said that there are still divisions within government in your statement about how to deal with this threat? There's, there's no division yep. amongst parliamentarians, and it's not a part of political um, <clears throat> matter. Where there is, I think, still a grey area is the attitude of the Foreign Office in particular, which doesn't like to rock the boat on these uh, matters, and how much ministers may challenge um, that. But the government's decision to sanction just two individuals and one company is being called feeble by some Tory MPs. Even action aligned with Western allies can't unite this fractured Conservative Party. Still in the Commons, there are voices of dissent. It seems like whatever he can do, he can't change the narrative. Well, this isn't about uh, playing party politics. This is about defending the national security of the United Kingdom. That's why I made the announcement today. That's why I made it in conjunction with our allies in the United States. It's why uh, I was in Seoul for the Summit for Democracy last week. Uh, engaging with our allies from around the world. But in a bumper election year where more voters than ever in history will head to the polls in over 60 countries, how significant is the wider threat to global democracy? I can't help but say that they're sort of trying to shut the stable door after the horse has bolted, but we still have time. Our our intelligence agencies are top class and will be doing all they can to stop the hacking. I worry about MPs being hacked. I mean, that's a security issue and it puts people off doing these jobs. The worry around here is it's all too little, too late. And as Parliament breaks up for Easter, the PM still struggling to find any point of harmony with his MPs. Beth Rigby, Sky News, Westminster. Uh, Beth Rigby there. Now, Conservative MP Tim Lawton is one of the several parliamentarians who were called in to attend a security briefing today after that news that China targeted him and some of his colleagues in a string of cyber attacks. And he joins us now uh, live from Central Lobby, uh, where you're dipping in and out of vote. So thanks very much for squeezing us in this evening. How did you first discover that you've been targeted by China? Well, we have been sanctioned for three years uh, is the anniversary um, tomorrow. That's seven parliamentarians, including me, Ian Duncan Smith and, uh, uh, and others. And certainly over that time, we have been subject to some pretty intimidating uh, stuff from through social media, through uh, impersonations uh, uh, on our uh, emails. Um, family members have received communications. 
and people, importantly, exiles from China, from Uyghurs, Tibetans and others that we've been supporting and working with, have also been targeted uh, as, uh, as well. So this has been going on for some, some years. We weren't aware of this specific cyber attack that dates back to 2021 until we had the briefing today. Um, I mean, it sounds pretty alarming, saying family members have been communicated with. I mean, I don't know how much information you're able to give us, if you can tell us what actually happened. Well, I'm not going to go into to, to detail, and these have all been things that we've reported to the parliamentary security authorities, and in some cases the police as, uh, as, as well. But certainly we are the subject of quite a lot of uh, intimidation. But it turns out that this goes much wider, and obviously what we heard today was that there was an attempt to attack, a malicious cyber attack on the Electoral uh, Commission, uh, on our whole democratic uh, process. And now we've learned, although we didn't learn it from the minister, we've learned it from the communique from the Americans this evening, that 43 parliamentarians were the subject of that uh, cyber attack as, uh, as well. So this is, this is serious stuff. You know, this is malicious cyber activity by hostile actors, as they've been described by ministers today. And yet, I'm afraid we were all rather underwhelmed with the government's response, which is to say, we're taking this very seriously. Good, they need to. And we're going to sanction two people, two pretty lowly officials, and one private company, which employs 50, 50 people. That is just not good enough. The Americans have sanctioned now, I think, 46 um, people and, uh, and growing. We need much more robust action to show China that this is absolutely unacceptable and there are consequences and those consequences will be followed through and at the moment they're not. You say the government's response is underwhelming. Do you feel personally let down? I do feel um, let down. I mean we have been uh, constantly requesting uh, support and security um, uh, support over the last few, uh, uh, few years. I mean, we don't know if there are Chinese red, what's called red notices, out on all those sanctioned MPs, that if we find ourselves in certain countries which have arrangements with uh, China, we could be um, arrested. So we've been asking for other more support. But look, this goes beyond the seven parliamentarians who have been uh, sanctioned, uh, uh, Sophie. There are people who have escaped from, uh, uh, from China, increasingly tens of thousands of people escaping from Hong Kong, who are being subject to extraterritorial intimidation by the Chinese uh, authorities, who have no regard for the international uh, rule of, uh, of law. And that's why it requires Western democracies like the United Kingdom to stand up to this, to call them out, to face up to, uh, to them, and for, for us to say there are consequences of this, and for China to be convinced that those consequences will be, uh, will be carried out. And frankly, just sanctioning two lowly officials and a small private company are not very consequential. And that, I think, is why we're so underwhelmed today. And, and frankly, the government's got to ramp up its response to this. This is serious stuff. At the same time, though, you know, China is the second largest economy in the world. Trade with China is really important. You know, inflation, cost of living is really important. Do we just need to accept that? So this is a difficult balance, and this is what David Cameron always used to, to say. David Cameron and his whole premise behind the great golden age was that by encouraging economic activity with, uh, with China, which is mostly one way. Remember, we have a huge export deficit with, uh, uh, with China, but trying to encourage their money into big projects in the, uh, in the UK would sort of bring China into the international community, would make them more responsible, would make them uh, abide by the rule of law. Well, that's turned out well, hasn't it? Because they've completely taken advantage of that. We've had to pass legislation in this country, largely um, pushed by uh, MPs such as uh, uh, myself to get this legislation, to exclude Chinese companies from being involved in strategic infrastructure projects, uh, security um, uh, projects, telecommunications uh, projects, nuclear power uh, stations, where, frankly, we cannot trust them to be part uh, of that. So I think the dial has very much switched to that balance between economic opportunity, which David Cameron always went on about, to risk and threat. I think China, the Chinese government, is the, uh, is the biggest threat to the globe these days across a whole range of uh, areas. And I think these latest revelations have just shown that we need to go in any dealings with China fully with all our eyes um, open and know exactly what their intent uh, is before we sign anything on the, on the dotted line. 
You've been very candid in your thoughts on the underwhelming government response, as you put it. Um, and I do value the chance to speak to you know, MPs like you who tend to give straight answers to straight questions. So I thought I would just squeeze one in at the end. Because there have been lots of talks about plots to replace Rishi Sunak with Penny Morden. And I'll be honest, I don't know what's going on. Can you tell me, how seriously should we take this? Um, you shouldn't. Okay. And what I, what I slightly resented is the package by Beth uh, Rigby at the beginning of uh, this, and she came to the press conference that uh, Ian Duncan Smith, Stuart uh, Macdonald and I held um, earlier, trying to link this whole um, China thing to, oh, it's all divisions within the Conservative Party and the Prime Minister's having to sort of switch attention to overseas. That's complete nonsense. This is nothing to do with the current state of politics in the, uh, uh, in the UK. Um, I, I'm a big fan of Rishi Sunak. I think he's doing a ra remarkable job in really difficult um, circumstances in a fairly fractious um, party, unnerved by what's going on in the opinion polls at the moment. Are we going to change leader again? We will be completely crackers to change a leader yet again. Rishi Sunak is not the problem. I think he's part of the uh, solution. And if more of my colleagues, there's not many of them, would stop talking to the, uh, the press and coming up with all this chatter about these imaginary um, plots and focus instead on what the government is doing, what the government is doing for the country, which is what my constituents are, are much more concerned about, we might be in a rather better uh, shape. So, no, there's no plotting going on by anybody of any uh, consequence. We are not going to change uh, uh, leaders. And when we have that election, probably later in the year, I hope we'll be in a much more unified state and people will see the benefits keeping a Conservative government rather than taking a very, very substantial risk by electing a Labour government that has uh, no plan and whose numbers have already completely uh, been blown to pieces uh, anyway. We'll have to see how the rest of the year uh, goes ahead of that election. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Always good to talk to you on the programme. Tim Lawton there. Well, a little earlier, I spoke to the former UK National Security Advisor, Sir Mark La Grant, for his perspective on the threat posed by China. You know, am I missing something? Because you, know, you listen to the UK government, they're talking about the need to defend democracy against China. But all they're doing is sanctioning two people in one company. I mean, it feels like a pretty big gap between the rhetoric on the one hand and then the reality on the other. Well, the government's sort of approach to China was set out in the, in the latest uh, Security and Defence Review. And that talked about uh, a three pronged approach, which was protect, align and engage. And that balance between protecting our interest from China's hostile activity, you know, aligning ourselves with allies and neighbours, Western neighbours in the region of China, like Japan and Korea and Australia, but also engaging with China, which is actually necessary because China is the second largest economy in the world. And if we are to find our way in the world and grow our economy, we're going to need to engage with China. So there is always going to be a balance between the sort of outright security people who want to say we must stop any Chinese involvement in UK society and the economists and the business people who say, look, we have to be able to deal with China. And the government is trying to uh, plot a way between that. Do you think now, it's moved a long away way in, in since the, right... the time of... Well, Apologies. Do you think they plotted away in the right area? The time of David Cameron and George Osborne and the golden era of UK-China relations. Clearly, that is now out of the window, and we're into a much more uh, careful, cautious, security-driven phase where China is seen, if not as a direct threat to the UK, nonetheless an epoch-defining challenge, as Rishi Sunak put it in that review. And so this is what the government is trying to do, to push back against egregious Chinese behaviour, like this hacking of the Electoral Commission, um, but also not completely go overboard and cut off all ties with China. Um, the timing of this I find quite interesting because, you know, China has been hacking UK politicians for a while now. You know, this isn't really a new thing. Uh, that electoral commission attack, again, was you know, a little while ago too. Do you think this is about UK politics as well as the relationship with China? I don't think so, because I don't sense a great difference of approach towards China between the two major parties. So it's not a sort of an electoral issue in this country, really, any more than it is in the United States. 
Um, it is a sort of bipartisan policy in that sense. I think it's more of a sort of coordinated Western approach. You've seen today that the U.S. Justice Department has charged seven uh, Chinese nationals with uh, espionage and, and hacking. So the West as a whole is decided that it's better now to confront China when evidence arises of their misbehavior rather than dealing with it privately, as has happened in the past. Um, I'm interested to get your take on how much of a threat China really is. You know, is this something that we should be very concerned about? Or is this because it's a big power that isn't a Western power? And so that's why the West is always a bit jumpy about China. Well, I would be a lot more concerned about Chinese activity in the economic field than I would be in the sort of national security or political field, um, to be honest. Uh, Russia is much more advanced in terms of its uh, attempts to undermine our institutions, create divisions in our country, interfere in our elections. We saw that they interfered in the Scottish referendum in 2014, the EU referendum in 2016. We've seen them obviously interfere in uh, elections, presidential elections in the United States. Very, very direct threat against our way of life. China's threat is a little bit longer term and more strategic. They focused really until quite recently on economic espionage, trying to steal um, intellectual property, trying to boost the Chinese economy through their cyber uh, activities. It's relatively recently that uh, China has embarked on more political hacking, like we saw of the Electoral Commission. And that's why I think the British government is beginning to harden its position on that. Do you think the British government's got it about right? I think the policy is about right. As I say, we can't just declare um, China a hostile state and not engage at all with China, given the size of its economy and our economic needs as a, a medium-sized uh, democratic trade trading nation. Um, but we need to be aware. You know, when I was the National Security Advisor, you know, all the discussions in the National Security Council boiled down to a balance between three policy pillars, the security pillar, the prosperity pillar and the values pillar. And that's why when we discussed Huawei, you know, you had ministers who argued that Huawei was essential to have the 5G rollout in the UK. You had other ministers saying, what about the security risk? And other ministers saying, what about the values? China is not a democratic country. Look what's happening in Hong Kong, etc. And so these are very difficult decisions for the government to get right, get that sort of balance between engagement, uh, protection uh, and, and alignment of allies. So uh, I think the government's probably got that about right. What okay. we've also seen in recent years is a willingness of the intelligence agencies to name and shame in a way that never happened in the past. And I think this is a very welcome trend of greater transparency. We saw that in the run up to the Russian invasion of Ukraine, where Western, you know, the Five Eyes actually put out into the public domain intelligence they had that Putin was about to invade Ukraine. It, as an effort to deter that invasion. It didn't work, but nonetheless, that greater transparency is, I think, a good thing. And the fact they're now calling out China rather than saying, um, we don't know where it's from or just raising it with the Chinese ambassador privately, I think is a sign of a greater uh, willingness to use intelligence to prevent hostile activity against the UK. OK, thank you very much, uh, Indy. Good to have you on the programme. Mark Wilgram. Now, in response to the government's announcement today, a Chinese embassy spokesperson said the so-called cyber attacks by China against the UK are completely fabricated and malicious slanders. We strongly oppose such accusations. China has always firmly fought all forms of cyber attacks according to law. China does not encourage, support or condone cyber attacks. At the same time, we oppose the politicisation of cybersecurity issues and the baseless denigration of other countries without factual evidence. It goes on to say, we urge the relevant parties in the UK to stop spreading false information and stop their self-staged anti-China political farce. Well, that round is sure to feature in tomorrow's papers. We'll have our extended press preview and news review from 10.30 this evening with tonight's news and tomorrow's headlines. Joining us will be the political editors of The Sun and The Guardian, Harry Cole and Pippa Creer. You're watching The Politics Hub coming up.
Another month, another by-election as disgraced Conservative MP for Blackpool South Scott Benton quits Parliament. How big a headache is his resignation for Rishi Sunak? And the government's talking tough on China, but would Labour go further? We'll hear from Shadow Cabinet Minister Nick Thomas-Simmons. Plus, as well as the military threat to the UK, reports of increased cyber threats to our institutions, including suggestions that Russia and China were behind some of the conspiracies spread online about Kate Middleton. We'll get reaction from our guests, John McDonnell and Caroline Noakes. That's next. It took a huge amount of courage, I think, and she was very calm, very composed, so I think she did a fantastic job of it. Um, it must have been very emotional for her. Um, you can see she's, you know, she's been made up, she's had her hair done, so there must have been quite a long build-up to it, which I can only imagine how nervous and anxious she must have felt during that time when she was just preparing and getting ready. And then, obviously, completely heartbreaking when she says uh, the struggle to tell the kids that she's going to be OK. Yeah. Absolutely shattering. Why do you think William wasn't sat with her? I personally think that was the right call. I mean, some people have had a go at him on social media about this. Think? <laughs> yeah, surprise, surprise. Yeah. Um, but after all the speculation and people saying, you know, the, uh, the photoshopped Mother's Day picture, I think it needed to be really simple, just her by herself telling her story um, with nobody else in the frame. I think it was actually a mistake to have the kids in the Mother's Day picture. Um, so I think it was the right call, and I think she just looks very candid and open and comfortable and honest. I think we can say that she still does have it because they're talking about her needing months out for treatment. Um, I think that we are not going to see her back on royal duties anytime soon. Um, and that I think the palace have a limited window now where they can think ahead to how public mood and attitude might change in a couple of months' time if we haven't had any kind of updates. So I think they might just want to get their heads around what their strategy will be. Obviously, most people will simply be concerned that she's OK and will want her recovery to be going well um, and will just be worried about her. But obviously, there is this contingent on, of people on social media spreading conspiracy theories. We know that a vacuum is coming because they don't want to give a running commentary. So there will be a period of time in which people will be comfortable with that vacuum. But after a while, questions will start getting asked again. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's already people marauding around social media claiming the videos and AI generated fake and all that kind of <laughs> which stuff. Which is absurd, completely absurd. <laughs> talking at uh, China and I guess the row uh, that we're seeing in the Conservative Party over the response. Tim Loughton, we just heard from uh, saying that it is uh, underwhelming and the former immigration minister, Robert Jenrick, also tweeting to say the government clearly is not holding China to account for their attack on democracy. Taking three years to sanction two individuals and a small country is derisory. The feeble response will only embolden China to continue its aggression towards the UK. Well, let's get the response now, shall we, from our duo for this evening, the former Chair of Chancellor John McDonnell and the Chair of the Women and Equalities Committee. That is Caroline Noakes. Thanks for both for being on the programme. Um, Caroline, so which side do you fall down on? Do you fall down on the Tim Lawton and the Robert Jenrick side, saying the government's not doing enough, uh, or do you actually support um, what Rishi Sunak's doing? Well, look, Rishi's given himself the option of being able to ramp up sanctions. I hope he does so, and in fairly swift order. But don't forget, and Tim pointed this out, that we've seen the Procurement Act, we've seen the National Security and Investment Act, we've seen action in our higher education institutions on freedom of speech. There has been a sustained ramping up of efforts against China. That clearly needs to continue because you can't have a foreign state trying to hack the Electoral Commission and intervene in our elections. And as Tim pointed out, the security implications for backbench members of parliament are significant. Although I have to say, if China ever wants to hack my mobile phone, they would have encountered, I think, 27 minutes of me talking to HMRC this afternoon, which wasn't <laughs> terribly interesting. What would they get if they hacked your phone? Anything more exciting than that? Almost certainly me shouting at the council, so not <laughs> housing people, that sort of yeah. thing, really. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, mine will probably be a load of cat pics. Yeah. So I'm not sure it'll be quite what they're after either, but never mind. <laughs> um, what do you, what's your take, John? Well, I can understand why the individual MPs are concerned mm. about this, because that it is a security risk. Mm. The big one for me was the hacking of the Electoral Commission. Yeah. Mm because we've got elections coming up in a large number of countries at the moment, and if that's the escapade that they're undertaking to try and influence the election, that's dangerous. Um, I've been frustrated about the issue of China as well. I've been raising issues around a number of my colleagues in Hong Kong, trade union colleagues who've been in prison now three years, mm -hmm. and I've felt the government has been pretty ineffectual about that. There's a diplomatic language, um, and no one's talking about going back to a Cold War situation or anything like that. But there's a diplomatic language that they understand and we understand. And what happened today, we were at the, almost the lowest end of the diplomatic language of saying how angry we were about what they'd done. Mm. In the normal run of things, something like this, you're sending diplomats home. Uh, you aren't mm. really telling them this is serious stuff. And you are reviewing some of the contracts that they might be looking for for the future. Sometimes you're cutting your nose off to spite your face economically, I understand that. But sometimes there's higher values to protect as well. And interference in our elections is a, is a line you, you should never let anyone cross. There's also been a bit of chatter today about um, Kate Middleton and the you know, really upsetting story that we uh, saw emerging about her uh, cancer diagnosis and that some of the disinformation may have come from foreign players. I mean, this is quite alarming. Oh, and deeply upsetting, actually. Yeah, but I... I read some of the coverage and ha had to watch her statement and it was just horrible mm. that the Princess of Wales had been pushed into a position where she had to come out and talk about a really, really personal matter. Now, to be quite frank, I'm not interested in the individual health conditions of members of the royal family. I want them to be healthy and I wish them well. And uh, actually, I'm much more concerned about the homegrown conspiracy theorists and we heard it all, mm. didn't we? All of which was nonsense and pushed an unwell woman into being forced to make a public statement. I just think it was wicked. I also think as well, uh, yeah, wicked as well. I think as well, the timing of it, she said that they had, they wanted to do it um, when they did because of the Easter holidays so that they could effectively prepare protect their, their children, children yeah, exactly. from the, yeah. the, the coverage that would yeah. obviously come back. Yeah. It, it yeah. is, it's, it's an awful story. There's an issue about media responsibility Absolutely. as well here. Mm. I think there needs to be another discussion about the nature of it. It isn't just about stopping hacking by some of the media in the past. It's also about standards of behaviour and how you treat people. Mm. And that's the, I think that was the most distressing bit, the fact they hadn't had the time really to mm. inform their children properly. Yeah, I think that's it. Um, thank you both uh, very much for interesting discussion uh, there. Now, the former Conservative MP Scott Benton today resigned from Parliament, triggering a by-election in Blackpool South. It could happen as soon as May the 2nd. Now, that is the same day as voters go to the polls in the local elections. The outgoing MP had the Conservative whip removed last April after suggesting to undercover reporters at the Times that he would be willing to break lobbying rules for money. Sky's political correspondent Tamara Cohen reports. We vote in House Commons two or three times a day. Brought down by a lobbying scandal, here's the Tory MP Scott Benton filmed by undercover reporters at the Times newspaper at a London hotel. There's written questions as well where we can table things on the public record. As he bragged that he could influence ministers and leak documents to people he thought worked in the gambling industry. He was found to have committed an extremely serious breach of the ethics rules. Parliament's Standards Committee said he'd sent out the message that he was corrupt and for sale. As he faced being ousted by voters with a recall petition, today he wrote on Facebook, It is with a heavy heart that I've written to the Chancellor this morning to tender my resignation as your MP. I'd like to thank the hundreds of residents who've sent supportive messages, cards and letters over the last few months and who have urged me to continue and fight the next election. Blackpool, with its faded seaside glory, is one of England's most deprived areas and voted heavily for Brexit. Constituents felt he'd sealed his own fate. Good riddance to him. The, the one we had before, um, Labour man, he was better, even though I'm a Tory, he did a lot better for us than what Scott Benton did. Well, he didn't do a good enough job, you know what I mean? Like I say, it's the whole time he was on. Like I say, too many homeless people on the streets, too many drug users, not enough facilities, and like I say, everything goes to pop. This will be Rishi Sunak's eighth by-election since becoming Prime Minister, and his party's only won one. Labour will be rubbing their hands after a string of by-election landslides across their former heartlands. Jumping before he was pushed, 
and another seat on the government's benches now at risk. Tamara Cohen, Sky News. Well, another by-election is a potential headache for Rishi Sunak, but how confident is Labour over winning the seat? A little earlier, I spoke to the Shadow Cabinet Office Minister, Nick Thomas-Simmons, about hopes for Blackpool South and fears over China. Thank you very much for being on the programme. Uh, good to have you here. How concerned are you about China's activities? Well, it's a pleasure to join you, as always, Sophie. And, of course, that was a matter of grave concern that we heard about in the House of Commons today. We cannot have any interference by a foreign government in our democracy. We've heard today that the government will be sanctioning two individuals and indeed another organisation with links to the government of China. We, of course, support those moves. But we also think we need to look more broadly now at our contest strategy. We need to look at not just those groups that wish us harm, but we need to be looking at states as well. So. The next Labour government, if we are privileged enough to be elected, will be reviewing our China strategy very early in the life of that government. I think that's hugely important in view of what we've heard today. So you would adopt a tougher strategy on China, is that what you're saying? I do think the government needs to look at its approach and appreciate the challenge that China poses. OK, so they need to look at their approach and appreciate the challenge that China poses. Would Labour take a tougher line on China? I, th if I, th I, think, I think that on the basis of what we've heard today, in that area of the relationship with China, which is about the security challenge, yes, we do need to be more robust, and that is exactly what the next Labour government, if we're privileged to have one, will do. But we also have to bear in mind as well that there are other dimensions to the relationship. There's still tens of billions of pounds worth of trade with China every year. And whilst in the medium term we do need greater resilience in our supply mm. chains, businesses uh, that are trading need that certainty. And also there is a competition, of course, in some areas. Take, for example, steel, where it's really important. The next Labour government would invest in a green steel fund. That is important as well. But also, there are so many of the world's problems that require China as part of the solution, and not least is, climate change. This is the thing, isn't it? This is the truth, right? You know, yes, we can moan about MPs being hacked and espionage uh, by China, but the reality is it's the second biggest country in the world. This government, the next government, you're not going to do much, are you? I disagree, because I think that what we will do is be looking at our robust response where there is a security challenge it is completely and utterly unacceptable if parliamentarians can't go about their daily business without uh, interference. So that will be absolutely critical and we will never be compromising, whether it is in relation to the situation in Xinjiang, whether it's in relation to the situation in Hong Kong, we will always speak out for our democratic values, but recognising as well that there are issues where we have to recognise on trade, for example, that there is a need for that certainty okay. too. So it's a multi-dimensional relationship, but it is one where we have to be absolutely robust on security. Um, I want to talk about the Israel-Hamas uh, war now, if I may, because the UN has today passed a motion calling for a ceasefire in Gaza. Do you welcome that? Yes, and I think that it... Uh, is again underlining the position we've been taking for some weeks uh, of an immediate humanitarian ceasefire. That was the uh, motion that the House of Commons actually ended up uh, passing and opposed some weeks ago. They've gone further than you, haven't they, though? Because they've just called for any ceasefire, whether it's sustainable or not. They've gone further. Well, well we chose the, that wording because it was in line with allies, for example, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. So we deliberately chose that wording because it added weight to the calls for a ceasefire that were already out there. But we need to see now an end to the fighting. There's no dispute about that. We've got million, million and a half uh, Palestinians at the moment that are sheltering in Rafah. We've set out so an ambiguity that that's actually would you take, would you take the UN position, then, that any ceasefire, a ceasefire right now, well, sustainable or not, what, what, ceasefire what, whatever, needs to happen? Well, look, it's got to be a... We all know it's got to be a sustainable, permanent ceasefire. That's that absolutely happen, though, correct. It's difficult but to know got, if it will be. But we've got to put every effort into making that possible. And it's got to be sustainable. And it's got to be that we once again uh, start or restart the efforts for a negotiation towards a two-state solution, which was put in the too difficult box by the international community for too long.
And just finally, Scott Benton, Conservative MP, has resigned. Uh, that means a by-election in Blackpool South. That's an easy one for you, isn't it? Uh, we never take any votes for granted, and we'll be up there fighting for every vote. Excellent local candidate up there, Chris Webb, who's been about uh, for some time campaigning. It's his local area. I'm sure he's shown great it's... passion during the campaign to make You've sure... You've got to be confident. We... Uh, we are uh, always confident but not complacent, and we certainly won't take a single vote for granted. Hitting all those lines, uh, your bosses will be very proud indeed. Uh, Nick Thomas-Simmons, thank, uh, thank you very much. You're watching The Politics Hub coming up. It's the book the whole of Whitehall is reading. No, not the Civil Service Code or the latest Nadine Dorries, but a novel about a solar flare apparently missing the planet Earth. It's informing the hive mind, and Sam Coates has been finding out why that is next. And next up, lots more from, I guess, John McDonnell and Caroline Noakes on the coming by-election in Blackpool South, and, of course, the looming general election as well. Elections everywhere you look. Well, today's news that there's a by-election triggered in Blackpool South and, of course, the looming general election, the prism through which all politics is being seen at the moment. Let's chat again, shall we, to John McDonnell and Caroline Noakes. Well, Nick Thomas-Simmons was pretty reticent there, I thought, not taking anything for granted. <laughs> um, Blackpool South, that's, that's, a, that's an easy win for Labour, isn't it? Nick stuck to the standard line, bless him. Should be able to win it. Um, I campaigned up the last time. Chris Webb is our candidate, born and bred, so he is well known. So we should, we should win. Nick's right, you can't take anything for granted. Look what happened in Uxbridge. There's always the 
potential local issues come up and that sort of thing. Should be all right, but it's a matter of just... The problem is always turnout, mm. and when there's low turnout, anything can happen. So what we'll be concentrating on is just making sure we get the vote out. Mm. And then, of course, on May the 2nd, you've mm. got a bumper set of elections. In. That, that could, it, we could have Blackpool South, but certainly we'll have a whole raft of, of council elections. I mean, it's going to be a really difficult night for the Conservative Party, isn't it? Well, I don't make any predictions about elections. There's only well, one poll that, that matters, isn't there? Um, but look, we're all out working very hard ahead of them. And we've got city council elections in Southampton, where I'm the MP. We've got police and crime commissioner elections, not to mention the mayoral elections up and down the country. Um, and people like Andy Street campaigning hard, popular in the West Midlands. So I think you know, there's, there'll be a lot to watch on the 2nd of May, won't there? There'll be a lot, of watch to, a lot to watch on the 2nd of May and on the 3rd and the 4th. I mean, I'm just interested, how much of a moment do you think it could be for the Prime Minister? You know, if he does have a difficult night, can you see other backbenchers perhaps you know, moving against him or what, how do you think it could play out? No, and I wrote an article about this just last week, look, the talk of plots and unseating the Prime Minister, what a load of old nonsense. Mm -hmm. And uh, to be quite frank, I think colleagues who are chuntering about that, and I saw one report that suggested as many as 12, wow, 12 MPs <laughs> uh, were plotting against the PM. You know, I, it's a sports team, not a cabinet in waiting. And I think the reality is, is that Rishi is doing a fine job in really difficult circumstances. This has been a tough parliament. We've had COVID, we've had the war in Ukraine, we've now got uh, threats from both Russia and China. It's really tricky. And the Prime Minister is really hardworking, he's very clever and absolutely the right man to lead us into the general election. Chinese Communist, the Chinese Communist Party have got nothing on the Tory party when it comes to plotting at the moment. <laughs> and I think wherever you go in the, in the Commons at the moment, there are little groups of people plotting in dark corners. So I, anything could happen after May the 2nd. I think if there are catastrophic re results, yeah, I think there could be a move against Rishi. And what, what's your prediction for general election timing? October, November. How about you? Yeah, I mean, look, we'd all love a summer election and nice light evenings and sunshine, <laughs> wouldn't we? We're not going to get it. Uh, it'll be the tail end of the year. And if I was the PM, and he won't do this, if I was him, then I would call it the first week in September and have an early October election. Uh, but that destroys party conferences, doesn't it? And I was just reflecting a minute ago, talk of Blackpool. It must be 20 years since I've been to Blackpool or to a party conference there. So, look, I'll be looking forward to a return visit and uh, the seaside in the spring, I guess. Well, launch the general election campaign at party conference, maybe with an early autumn statement in September. Interesting. Get your winter coats out then. Uh, mm. Thank you, both uh, Caroline and John. You are watching The Politics Hub coming up. Bear with me. This is about the threat in the late 2030s of a solar flare heading to Earth and decimating the globe. <laughs> The book almost the whole of Whitehall has on their bedside table, but what does it tell us about the civil service hive mind? Sky News Centre at 7. Now that you're up to date, we can go into a bit more detail. Things can change incredibly quickly. Taken by surprise. Have you ever known a moment like this in British politics before? Yes. <laughs> Cheers. We'll start with breaking news. Let's get the latest on the ground. So, by the end, we'll hopefully all understand what's going on in the world just that little better. Big stories don't always come from big cities. I'm Lisa Dowd and I'm Sky's Midlands correspondent and this is where I grew up. We can reveal that the driver who hit Harry Dunn is 42-year-old Anne Sekoulas. Just met the president and we never thought we'd get this far. This is what they're up against, that the wind is the really big problem. It is back-breaking work and the smoke is thick. 
It's been working well. Water levels are dropping, but no one knows what impact further rain will have. What would you do if this place wasn't open? So. We take you to the heart of the stories that shape our world. It's really scary. We're terrified. In this community, I'm told that everybody knows someone affected by COVID. Hopefully this will be the last wave. <laughs> I never knew they would make it. It's amazing. Change seems tantalisingly close in this corner of the UK. Wales was the first to introduce the plastic bag charge. This is my patch, my specialism. It's also my home. Hello, welcome back to the Politics Hub. Now, there's a book doing the rounds in Whitehall. It's a novel about a solar flare nearly hitting planet Earth. Why on Earth are we talking about this on the Politics Hub? It's a very, very legitimate question, and one I'm going to put to our deputy political editor, Sam Coates. What's going on? So this is a book called The Helios Deception. Right. You probably haven't heard of it. I don't know what that is. It's self-funded, self-published, and it came out last November. So why on Earth are senior civil servants reading it? Well. If you look at the description on Amazon, and it's about £3.17 on Kindle when I downloaded it yesterday, um, it says it that... Sam's not getting paid to promote this, by the way. <laughs> you'll, you'll see why. Um, uh, you'll see it says that it draws on very senior extensive experience in the senior civil service. And when you look at it and you start to read it, you realise it contains all sorts of extraordinary details that I didn't realise that anyone would put in the public domain. And the more you scratch at this, the more it was a mystery. Clearly, the author's name, Charles R. Marlowe, well, there are no senior civil servants, current or former, with the name Charles R. Marlowe, and then somebody tipped me off. It's a guy called Charles Roxburgh. He was the second permanent secretary in the Treasury. He knows everything that there is to know about how government works, and he's married to Karen Pierce, our ambassador in Washington. So I started asking more people, does this ring any bells? Let's have a look at what happened when I ran it, ran it round Whitehall. I read out extracts to one civil servant who said, you know, when he says things like, we'll cover all the hot topics, that's exactly what he used to say in meetings that I was in, they said. You know, he's quite well liked, he's a quiet speaker. I'm told he had some spare time waiting off for the appointments committee to si sign off other, other work. And this book, you know, which is actually published by an uh, organisation called Book Baby, which is a self-publishing firm, appears to just reveal how it works in Whitehall. And that's why they're all reading it. So, I mean, China doesn't need to worry about hacking us. It's all in this book. I mean, there's a bit more in this book than I would have expected. It, <laughs> so it tells you where the secret meetings take place, how in the secret meeting rooms that are in 70 Whitehall, as it tells you, uh, there's a special fabric on the wall to stop people who might want to penetrate it and, and listen to what's going on. At one point... And I was really surprised about this, Sophie. There was a description about how, if you want to work with the intelligence services and hide money being spent from Parliament, there's a step-by-step -step guide how to do it. It explains that you set up a fake venture capital fund, uh, you include the funding of that venture capital fund uh, in the footnotes of a government report, uh, and then you beg this parliamentary select committee not to ask too many questions about it. I happen to know, Sophie, that's exactly how you do it if you want to uh, work with the intelligence services. I couldn't believe it when I saw it in black and white. <laughs> I couldn't believe that what essentially are secrets uh, all ended up in the public domain. It's not perhaps going to win the Booker Prize, if I'm being completely honest. £3.17 felt like quite a lot by the time I'd finished skimming through it. <laughs> um, it, 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 it had, it, it, it's absolute clickbait if you're a Treasury official I'm not sure how big that makes its audience. Yeah, that is very fair. Uh, Sam, thank you very much indeed. John and Caroline, what is going on? I have to say, this whole thing, I was just... I was like, hang on, what story are we doing? <laughs> so fair, Alison. Um, I guess maybe it shows the uh, loose lips uh, around mm. Whitehall that we see sometimes find. I think I've come across him in the Treasury so, at some stage. Do you really? Yeah, That's interesting. So, yeah. It's sort of that our Easter reading, hasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Are you tempted or have you got about a novel that you're planning uh, over the Easter break? No, I had to write a review of the last novel that I read and that was dreadful, so I won't be bothering <laughs> with this one. <laughs>
I love it. I love it. Um, is there a serious point to be made here about how you know, official secrets and the up in an Amazon book, or you know, do we need to not? Shouldn't we not worry too much about it? Well, I think it begins to get a bit worrying, doesn't it, when senior civil servants are spilling the beans in self-published novels? I don't think that's appropriate. <laughs> I think we need to be very careful. Um, and there, oh. you know, um, hold the civil service code, do the right thing. And I think we've always been able to rely on our civil servants to do that, and it feels a bit shaky. I think the openness and transparency, a bit of sunlight on some of these things, I think is quite important. I think we're a bit too secretive at times. Mm -hmm. And on issues like this, I think it's just knowing that how it works, I think is quite, how the establishment oils the wheels of its operation, I think is quite useful. Mm -hmm. Uh, tempting though it is, I think I might ask Sam to give his uh, editor digest for me uh, rather than <laughs> <laughs> taking my whole of my Easter to read uh, through. Is that okay? That's Happy fine. to do it? I've skimmed through it. That's quite enough. Okay, you can just give me the kind of headlines of it. You've had enough. Mm -hmm. um, how are you expecting Easter recess to go? Much mi mischief making? Uh, quietly, I think. Doing all the calls this weekend for that podcast, uh, <clears throat> everyone's shattered on all sides. I think it's been an incredibly long and bruising few weeks. Uh, there's been a lot of turmoil on both sides of the of the of the government aisle. Labour have not had the easiest time. The government clearly have had a difficult time. Will it settle down after the local elections? You don't know, but you don't know how they're going to go. And so, you know. Politics will ramp up towards a general election, but right now I think they're crawling for a break at the moment. Do you agree with that, then? Well, I'm not going on holiday. I'll be out leafleting and door-knocking for the local elections. No break for me. <laughs> Ides of May. I think there's going to be Ides of May for certain Prime Ministers. Do you, actually? If these, if these elections go wrong, panic sets in, and then all options are on the table. And I tell you, the biggest threat to the Labour Party in terms of Conservative leaders is Penny Morden, no doubt about it. Do you think that is right, yeah, I Penny do, Morden? I do, yeah. Well, I'm a huge fan of Penny, but as Tim said right at the start of the programme, be crackers. Um, I was quite interested to see Penny's name get out there. Do you think that was like a... I, I just don't understand who would put it out there. Is, is it the ones on the right of the party trying to tempt people like you to get rid, rid of Rishi Sunak, or...? Well, it's going to take a lot more than that for the right of the party to be able to persuade me to get rid of Rishi. Um, but, look, I think it was done by people who wanted to damage Penny because they know that she's a credible future leader. They know that she has a lot of public support. She's got very high profile. And you look at her in the Commons every Thursday. Beats it out of the park during business questions. Carrying okay. that sword did it for most people, I think. There you go. Uh, thank you both uh, very much uh, indeed. That is it from us uh, tonight. But I will see you tomorrow at 7pm. Up next, it is the UK Tonight with Sarah J. Me.